Buster, it's really great to speak to you. Um, we've made kind of impossible conversations and difficult conversations a real topic on the channel recently. We had a film with a uh, film called Impossible Conversations and also a series on the science and psychology of polarization. And you've just brought out a new book called Why Are We Yelling? And it's, it's really good. I've read it. It's, it's really good, really interesting. Lots of interesting tips, frameworks, concepts for understanding disagreement and I guess the first question should be why are we yelling? That's a great question to start with. I mean thank you for inviting me to the show. I'm so glad to be here. Um, why are we yelling? It's because we're we feel stuck. We feel frustrated about being stuck. We feel like everything we've tried has failed. We feel like we've put out our goodwill or we've tried to do the right thing multiple times and have been stomped on. Like all of these things have made us resentful about trying to reach out again and have productive disagreements. So, you know, what can we do if we feel like we have no other option? You know, we can yell into our pillows, we can yell into Twitter, we can do whatever, we can do all that kind of stuff. And that's why we're yelling right now. I really enjoyed some of the distinctions that you draw in the book between different kinds of disagreements and different strategies and want to tease those out. Um, but I want to start with one that you talk about productive disagreement as being a meta skill. And we never miss a, a chance to go meta on this channel. So um, what do you mean by that? And what is productive disagreement as a meta skill? Yes. So a meta skill is a skill that makes all of your other skills better or more likely to progress and grow faster. You, know, you, know, you could also think of it as psychotechnology. You can think of it as a superpower. It's really... You know, similar to you know, learning how to read, learning how to talk, you know, learning a new language, all of these things, once you learn them, you can now acquire new skills much more rapidly. And you know, what can make us even acquire skills even faster? Well, obviously, working through our disagreements, working through our problems, and seeing what's on the other side of a lot of these stuck conversations. Um, like we desperately need some of that. The word and the concept of psychotechnology seems to be like it seems incredibly useful. John Bavaki, I think, has kind of given it to us as a concept. And it's like language as a psychotechnology. Um, many of our habits of thought are psychotechnology. They're ways of dealing with problems. Um, what are the key psychotechnologies that you think we need for difficult conversations or um, productive disagreement, as you call it? Yeah, I think the art of productive disagreement is a technology, a psychotechnology in this sense, right? Like this, a disagreement is when two worldviews or perspectives are differ and it's unacceptable. So the psychotechnology I would like to advance is the one where we can move into that space of differences, different worldviews, and come out of it smarter, more connected, you know, having enjoyed the time if we can. Um, such that you know, the problems that we have don't, you know, I, I often say that we're stuck arguing at the gate of many of these problems. We're talking about whether or not the problem exists, not how to solve it. And we have to get through that gate, which productive disagreement can help us do, so that we can solve the problems. And can you talk about your personal background with this? Because you do describe in the book how the Trump election was a real kind of awakening moment, as it was for a lot of people, uh, certainly on the more liberal side of the spectrum. So can you talk about that, that kind of it, it, was that connected with the origin of the book? 100%, yeah. That was, I've always prided myself on being a civil disagreeer, you know, someone that can talk to people I disagree with without resorting to anger. Um, it turns out, though, that that's not enough, right? I have these group of friends, and, and we discussed the election politics situation happening all the way up through the elec election. And after it happened, I was unable to talk to them anymore. And so I felt like I had failed to relate to them, to understand them, to actually have a conversation, and, and I ended up just being, feeling lost. And, you know, if, if we feel lost in our closest relationships because we can't connect with them and can't talk about our disagreements, like, what are the chances that I'll ever be able to do that with, you know, a coworker or a family member or someone that I work with or, you know, someone I run into on the street? So it was an eye-opening moment for me to realize that I was, I thought I was good at this. It turns out I wasn't, and I had a lot of work to do to figure it out. And I, I like in the, in the book that you talk about uh, running towards disagreement or using disagreement productively. Where are you, how would you recommend people do that and where are you doing that at the moment in your life? Yeah, it's so, I mean, this is, this is the most surprising thing to me is that I now, my eyes light up when someone's like, I disagree with you. I'm like, wow, this is going to be fun. 
um, you know, and that could seem um, facetious, I guess, if, if uh, you know, you don't know me, but um, it's true. And I think that we do need to find that right level of disagreement to help us grow. Like we have to develop each other's skill in this. But once you do, um, you know, things that I've done, you know, I'm in several Facebook groups, for example, where I'm the only liberal person, the only progressive person. And my goal is to really just see the world from somebody else's perspective, get into, like, build some relationships, and then have these conversations. Um, you know, I'm in a couple of those. I'm in like a, you know, I'm in a flat earth group, you know, that's really f interesting and fun. I'm in a you know, pro-life group that is really interesting and fun. Um, maybe not fun, but, you know, interesting. Um, I'm in some libertarian groups. I'm in, you know, some that are about, um, you know, the culture wars. And, you know, I'm oftentimes the token, you know, progressive in the group. And I love that. And there's so many places, once you start looking, on Discord, on Letter, on Medium, on, you know, forums, on even on Twitter, you can find people to have these conversations with. As soon as you see it as the art, you know, and not the the tool for... Um, ranting, right? You have to just shift your your, your goal in terms of why, why you're there and what you're looking for. And how has that been? To, how has your experience been doing doing these explorations? At first, it was rocky, honestly. You know, it's, you know, when you're when I was first stumbling into this idea and you know opening up every disagreement you know I could find, I you know you, you step in poop every once in a while, and you know I had to do some um, sort of backing up in terms of, you know, why I went too far. This was out of my skill zone. I've lost, you know, some, some of my friendships are probably, you know, harmed by this. Um, so it's, it, it can definitely go both ways. You, that's why I definitely advocate developing the skill in, in steps. Um, but yeah, I think it has changed a lot of things. And once you start seeing disagreement as an opportunity, you know, my job changed. You know, I'm going to counseling for my marriage. Like we're considering different career choices, different, you know, moving to another different place of the world. All these things that we were avoiding become places to, um, you know, explore and hopefully find something better out of it. And have your views changed through any of these interactions? I think so. I think they've become more nebulous in a lot of ways. You know, in the sense of like, you know, simplistic opinions became more complicated. I have also. In some cases, like uh, there's a chapter about ghosts where I, I think my belief about ghosts has radically shifted, and um, I'm now like really into the idea of ghosts. You know, it's not just necessarily truth or like do they exist or not, but I appreciate the idea of ghosts more than I did before. Gun control, immigration, whether or not it's okay not to vote, these are all issues that my perspective has shifted on over time. Um, and I, I, you know, some of them have, have been 90 degree turns, some of them 100 degree turns, some of them just three degree turns. But always now I can see why somebody would have the other perspective. And what have you done since then to, to, to make yourself better at that? Yeah, I mean, I really just had to face it head on with a beginner's mind in the sense of not feeling like I knew how to do it, um, which meant inviting a lot of people to have conversations with me. Um, I opened up a lot of different, I called a lot of my friends and said like, okay, you know how we always argue about this? Let's have that argument, and I'm going to record it, and I'm going to like re analyze it afterwards. And I invited people into my home. I created Facebook groups. I created a discourse community, all focused on different angles into this. And some of them worked, some of them didn't work. And it was through that process that, you know, I I discovered a lot of people that have thought about this a lot, and I helped translate that into practical tips that can be. Uh, used in everyday conversations because we have a lot of tips that can be used in a courtroom or in a sales you know pitch, but we don't have the ones that work at the dinner table and online and you know in on the street. And what do you hope the book will achieve? I hope people will look at disagreement as a practice, you know, in the same way that meditation or going to the gym is, and find their skill level and start practicing because before until we can physically feel what it's like to have a productive disagreement and physically feel both our own stretching and sort of seeing something differently and sort of seeing how it brings you together with other people, we're not going to be able to expect that of other people. And I think that's one of the, you know, the, the crucial elements that's missing in our debates right now. So we don't expect our politicians and our leaders to have productive debates. The way that we change our expectation is by first experiencing ourselves, seeing why it's useful, and then hoping that others also have it. And that's the bottoms up sort of change in the world that I, I hope happens. And can you talk a bit about your background, uh, why you wrote the book and where, what the origins of it were? 
Yeah, so my background is from the tech world. I was at Amazon, Twitter, Slack, and you know, a bunch of startups. And my job as a product leader has always been to facilitate you know, diverse collections of people and get them to coordinate and produce something on time and actually re achieve the results that you want. Um, and so inadvertently, I found that a lot of these skills could translate to all kinds of um, other aspects of our lives, from the relationships, to our work, to politics, to you know, everything else, the friendships, and even our own self-talk you know, can, can benefit from this kind of stuff. So that was the impetus. And when I took stock of you know, what I could do to have a positive impact after the election, this was an area where I thought there was a big enough gap in knowledge, and I was sort of, you know, I felt like I was the right person to be doing this, that this is a better use of my time than almost anything else I could be doing. And also in the book, you mentioned that hidden disagreements are worse than surfaced ones, which I think is a really important um, realization. And it reminded me of a, of a saying my, my good friend Rafia talks about everything registers in the field. And this is sort of more from a kind of personal growth. Uh, perspective that everything on some level everything that's going on is registered and is is aware and playing out in the dynamic somewhere um, so from a maybe sort of less sort of personal growth orientated perspective how, how would you frame that what, what why do you think that's an important framework yeah I, I think that you know the there is as I was writing this book I was assuming that we would just I would be practicing having unproductive disagreements and making them productive what actually turned out to be the case was that people had already given up with disagreements. We are, we are okay with ranting and we're okay with um, doing zingers and sort of making the other side feel bad, but we're not actually in dialogue with the people we disagree with um, across many different um, sort of dimensions. And that was the most surprising thing. And I also read um, you know, Willful Blindness by Margaret Heffernan, I believe is her name, and she found that like 85% of people in a job situation or in a relationship situation know that something is wrong that they're afraid to talk about. And that's really just putting things below the surface, under the rug, and they don't go away. And they're in the field, and they're going to come back in some way. They're going to um, grow, they're going to accumulate, and soon that small problem is going to turn into a big problem and be harder to resolve at that point. Yeah, just you, you said that we weren't having disagreements, people were just sitting on them. Do you think that that's some kind of um, exhaustion or maybe sort of post, post Trump election kind of, we've had enough disagreements and now we're just sitting on it. What, what do you make of that? Absolutely, yeah, I think a lot of it is exhaustion, the lack of energy, the fact that we're all feeling really anxious. We don't want to add more to that, to that pile. But also I think it's, there's, there's a positive spin to it as well, which is historically, you know, how have we to resolve disagreements? We've used force, you know, might, might is right um, to resolve disagreements. And, you know, the fact that we're not doing that is, is good, except for some extremists. Um, we've always thought that reason was the way that we're going to resolve our disagreements, but it turns out that only works when you're both appealing to the same source of truth and the sort of same authority. And when you're going across tribes, you don't have the same authority um, and trust in that authority. You have different sources for information. And so it's, that's not working either. And so you're like, well, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, I got nothing, I'm going to stop doing anything, and plus I'm tired. And the question, I think it's, it's good to admit that the two things aren't working, but the thing I would, you know, I would I'd encourage us to go one step further and have curiosity about, you know, what are, the, what are we missing? Like, why is this so hard to resolve? What is it about our culture right now that is, or our relationship right now that's preventing us from communicating? And we got to build new skills to do that. And I think that opens up a whole new vista of, of possibilities in terms of how we relate to each other that are worth exploring. Do you have any theories about that? Why it is now that things are so much more seem to be so much more difficult? Part of it is we don't have the skills. We're we're in an arena where the the the, the difficulty of the conversations is way beyond our skill level, and so we're it's sort of like being thrown. You know, you've never done any public speaking. You're thrown on stage at the you know Rose Bowl or something, and it's really intimidating. And so you resort to you know defensive um, sort of things that will save your dignity a little bit. And oftentimes getting angry is, is, a, is a way to do that. Um, being negative is a way to do that. Um, and so we have to be able to get onto that stage. You know, maybe it starts with a smaller stage and you know, not freeze and not lash out, but actually continue being up there and be like, okay, well, this is what's happening. Let's talk about this. I wonder what we can learn from each other. And, and then do that until you're really good at it and then move to the next you know, sort of difficulty level. 
And you're, you're kind of in the center of Silicon Valley and have worked in the tech industry. Do you think the tech industry is at least partially to blame for this? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we're so complicit. And I had this real awakening when I, you know, I've always been an idealist in growing up. And that's part of what brought me to tech was this possibility of, you know, connecting the world and um, sort of giving everyone a voice. And we didn't think about the side effects as much. And that is something we definitely have to reckon with. And I feel complicit in that in, you know, the various roles I've had directly and just indirectly by being, you know, a participant in that ecosystem. So I think there's a lot of people here. Um, I'm not the only one by far um, that has come to this realization that, yeah, there's, we thought, what we thought was wrong. And we have to figure out what to do now. Mm. And uh, you, you sort of hinted at it there, but you think that feeling is quite widespread. And what, what are the conversations that are going on in, in Silicon Valley now around this? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are leaving tech, I think, you know, just like, you know, including myself, you know, writing a book is just so much more fulfilling to me than continuing to build these platforms that I feel, you know, are potentially making things worse. Um, so a lot of people are leaving. A lot of people are seeking smaller, um, you know, less ambitious goals. You know, just let's, let's, let's step away from the thing that is potentially a great good and a great bad at the same time and find something like, you know, let's just let's start a yoga studio or something. And uh, just finding this, you know, again, like trying to find the arena that we can actually feel more confident in. Um, and just generally, there's a lot of um, infighting. You know, any of these companies that you go inside the walls, you're going to find vastly polarized communities of employees there that are fighting about this. Um, and you can go anywhere and, and see that. And I, I don't think that's as visible from outside the tech world, but it's certainly there. And you, we saw it with Google, you know, obviously, and Facebook is starting to have that. I know Twitter has it. Um, and so they're not uniformly bad, necessarily. They're, they've, they've done some you know, uh, damage to the world, but there's also people in there that care about um, maintaining that um, and fixing it. So it's, it's an interesting situation, and everyone has to decide where they want to be in that ecosystem, if they can handle it or not. You also talk about in the book look how anxiety sparks in you. Can you explain what you mean by that and, and what, what that looks like? Yeah, so the, I think the beginning, the first step we can take is to try to think about why we get angry, why we feel anxious, why we leap into disagreements. You know, the whole joke about someone on the internet is wrong, I have to go, you know, tell them why they're wrong, right? Um, why? Why do we have to do that? What is, and, and I know what I found through just the research and consulting with experts and sort of reading a lot is, and having conversations, is that almost always you can tie that anxiety back to a value and a belief that you personally have. And I believe that that's a much better platform to then reach out and have a conversation about. You know, you can say like, hey, I feel threatened. You know, I feel like maybe you um, don't respect the same people that I do, or you don't, you know, value the, you know, the, the humanity in these people as much as I do. Is that true? Um, and you could find out, like maybe they had that—that that was not on their mind at all. Maybe they were thinking about something completely else. And that's one way to identify that, because we're always like, you know, find shared common ground. But how do you do that? Well, anxiety is the signpost that can sort of point you to the potential common ground to address. So yeah, you mentioned the word curiosity before, and I think that. That sort of come up again and again as a really important meta skill to develop. We did a series of films um, called The Science and Psychology of Polarization, which could have been called The Science and Psychology of Difficult Conversations, that used polyvagal theory and a lot of um, somatic experiencing work that comes from tra trauma work, um, showing how we're either in an exploratory frame of mind, we're open to new information, or a defensive frame of mind, and how we flip between the two. And the, the key for get it, potentially getting out of that was if we can become curious about our own defensiveness, that literally can rewire our experience. We can, we can start changing our own internal state and that can start changing. It's like, I think it's a kind of physiological hack that if, if we were taught this more widely could really change our conversations. Were, were you, what, firstly, what do you make of that? Were, were you aware of like polyvagal theory and those frameworks before... Uh, you wrote the book. Um, I've learned about it from your channel a little bit. Uh, that's probably the extent that I know it. Um, but I, there are a lot of conversations about psychological safety and curiosity, in the, and especially in the tech world, where you know, and, and there's an acknowledgement that that is crucial to having high-performing teams. And yet, on the other side, you want diversity. 
So diversity and sort of having multiple perspectives to sort of broaden your, your view of a problem is directly in tension with psychological safety because that's what makes you potentially have challenges of communication, misunderstanding, and that can spiral out of control. So again, it's like this two sides of the coin. You need to like make it a little bit safer, make it a little bit more diverse, and vice versa. You can't be curious unless you feel safe, and you can't force yourself to feel safe. And so that, that's when I think about, like, it's not just about you and me talking. It's also about what is the environment that we're in? What is our power dynamic? What is the, the expectation about, you know, bringing ideas to the table, inviting new people into the room, that kind of stuff. And all that kind of stuff can then trigger our psychology about, you know, are we safe? Can we be curious? Um, perhaps you can, you know, if you're on the verge there, you can jump into curiosity, um, but it's a fine line. Mm. Because, I mean, the, we're talking about diversity, and I, I mean, one of the big uh, things with diversity is, is ideological diversity, which is a lot harder to measure than some of the other metrics. And that maybe is where Silicon Valley has been criticized in the past of not having enough ideological or political diversity. Yep. I do, yeah, the past and the present, I believe. You know, I think there's definitely... Um, it's hard, you know, it does, because it challenges your safety and you, we're, we're all at this sort of feeling of feeling threatened all the time already. It's really hard to then extend that and make it more the case. So yeah, I, I think that there's, that's another piece of serious self-reflection that this tech world is doing. Um, and yet, you know, it's not that easy to solve. So it's not like we can just admit it and then fix it. It's more systemic than that. Yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot as the representation of the whole tech industry. So that would, that would be a really unfair thing to do. <laughs> yeah, what did you make of the, the, the sort of polyvagal frame? Did you find it useful? I do. And I, I think that anyone that, you know, does meditation or yoga or things like that, and you're, you can sort of sense when you shift. And I think that becoming aware of that is crucial especially when you are shifting from sort of safe conversation to disagreement, there's always this moment where something flips and you turn into you get your shield and your sword and you're like ready to fight. And that's probably when the polyvagal, you know, I forget the terms, but like one flips to the, the threatened state and b being able to notice when that's happening and potentially shift it back, that's probably the best time to do it rather than further down the line when you're feeling even more threatened or more hurt um, as a result of the back and forth. So yeah, I think being aware of that is, is really important. There have been a, a few other books coming out recently around this same topic. Like it feels like there's a, there's a real uh, well of interest in it as, a, as an area of inquiry. And one of them was the How to Have Impossible Conversations by Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay. Um, I wonder what you, you made of that. I'd say I've read both books and I'd say that theirs is probably more conversational techniques um, tactics and probably less goes less into the psychological realm and your book goes a little bit more into that sort of psychological um, area. I mean they do talk about psychological safety but it but I'd say their focus is more on strategies. Yeah 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 that's true and I think that's that's great we need the strategies to use in the moment um, but I also think we need to respect the fact that there's a lot more going in like we can't we can't just unroll the strategy list and, and do it right. We have to also consider our emotions, consider the sort of backdrop of the cultural um, divides that are happening. And that means also being willing to self-reflect and think about your own place in that. And, you know, I always consider it a blessing and a curse that I'm, I, I'm, I, I doubt everything that I, I think or do all the time. And yet that is sort of what we have to do, I think, to step back from, you know, I'm not just here to convince people that I'm right, because we actually don't know the answers to a lot of these questions. Yeah, I, I think there's a really big question here. Um, a, a friend of mine, and I think someone you know as well, uh, Peter Lindbergh, who wrote a really interesting piece about Culture War 2.0, where he talked about the need for mimetic mediation, which I think is a really great co concept. The idea that we're sort of splitting off into mimetic tribes uh, and that what's required is mediation between the tribes. That for me feels like a really important concept to enter the, the, the discourse at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that article that, that was written in the document. Um, and I would even go further and say that we need people that are tribeless, you know, in a, in a certain sense. Like we have, 
we, we acknowledge that there are people out there that have more privilege than others. And I think that the people that do have more privilege that are willing to, they want to put it to good use, could be the tribeless people that go around and try to hang out with the tribes that you know, most of their um, sort of culture has not gotten along with to understand them, to also be a representative of sanity uh, of the other side. And I think it works both ways to, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge amount of effort. And so it's not an obligation for us to do but there is this opportunity for people to travel between and hopefully not get exiled from all of them as a result. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit or ask you a couple of questions about your particular kind of political journey, because you talk a bit in the book about the Trump election and some arguments that were had around that. And um, we, we've talked just before we came on air about that, that you feel that you that this is partly related to writing the book. Can you t tell me a bit about kind of how your views have maybe changed or you've tried to kind of um, get more of a different perspectives into your uh, worldview? Yeah, I would, I would put myself, I think I took one of those tribe tests and I, I, I got the you know, far left progressive liberal designation that uh, you know, is, is sort of unpopular right now um, amongst <laughs> some people. Um, so I think that was my background, and that was that is continues to be my background, and I see a lot of the the good that comes out of that um, sort of line of thinking. Um, what changed for me was this realization that I was completely blind to a lot of things that were happening, a lot of things people were thinking, because I had my own you know worldview that I was filtering everything through, and this came through like just having you know a long conversation with a couple friends and realizing that we've known each other for twenty years and we can't connect. And that was heartbreaking. And if I can't connect with the people I know the best, how am I ever going to have a conversation with a stranger or a coworker or you know somebody else that disagrees with me? So I had to sort of sit back and think, you know, I'm doing something wrong. What am I doing wrong? And you know, that means having a lot of these conversations and being willing to examine hard things that I tended to believe by default, and and being willing to not necessarily change my mind, but expand my belief to include other possibilities as well. The conversation with those two friends, was that a political disagreement or? It was definitely the, you know, the, the conservative versus liberal argument. Um, you know, my friends are religious and have, you know, they live in, you know, Texas or Florida or often, or the Middle East and often give me this perspective like, oh yeah, this is how the other side is seeing what's happening. I'm interpreting it this way and they're interpreting it completely differently. And yeah, it was, it was definitely just a political disagreement at the time, but it does go much deeper than that in terms of, you know, values and of like, you know, what is, what's more important, uh, taking care of everyone or having freedom and independence. And, and so those, those are the, the big, you know, disagreements that we're having as a culture. Um, and I saw it reflected in my friendships. And you must be aware of Jonathan Haidt's work, I, I, I'm, I imagine. And so he talks about would you agree with his framing that many of our political beliefs are actually temperamental? So that a lot of the time we, we're arguing with, when we're arguing about political things, we're arguing with different temperamental types rather than um, fact-based or um, things that can be reasoned through. Yeah, that was hugely influential in my book because I, I, it was the first time I realized that, hey, there's several moral spectrums to judge something on. And we don't talk about them. We talk about good and bad. We don't talk about, you know, freedom versus, you know, s slavery and, or harm versus care or disgust versus cleanliness and all these other things. And yeah, that was, and, and you know, once you see that and you think that all of my arguments are about evidence and yet all of this is about values, we are arguing over here about this. And that's why it's not working. We have to first move into the, what I call like the, the realm of the heart, right? We have to talk about our values of, or what we care about, what we prefer in order to then connect. And then we can move on to what I call the realm of the hands, like doing something and seeing what works and seeing how it, ha how it unfolds and just leave the evidence behind because that's not going to actually, um, you know, solve anyone's question in the moment because they're actually caring about something completely different than you first. We're talking about kind of dialogue across divisions. And I know that you've been very involved in the, the letter platform which is a, a kind of new social media site designed for long form conversation across divides. How have, you, how have you found that? What kind of conversations are you having there? 
Great ones. It's so great. Uh, I mean, it's just the ability to have a long form conversation with people you disagree with. You know, where else can you do that? I mean, you can technically do it on your blog, um, but and you can do it on podcasts and stuff like that. But for the most part, we don't have a way to do that um, just as people and, and using Twitter and Facebook. So I my first conversation on there was with um, a fellow named BJ Campbell, who was a gun rights advocate um, and had published some really amazing articles on me Medium that were thoughtful, data-driven evidence. And we're like, let's talk about this on letter. And we had a fantastic conversation about it where our goal was to agree on some kind of policy proposal that we both felt would have an impact on gun violence, gun death um, in the long term. And after something like 14,000 words, we got there, which is, you know, it, it's a lot of words, but it's also we got somewhere that we've never gotten before. And I think we have to be willing to be patient to have those conversations individually before we can have them as groups, before we can have them as a country or, you know, as a world. So it's a great place to start. I was struck reading your book you reference the work of Robin DiAngelo and White Fragility. M my understanding of her work and, uh, is that she talks about White Fragility and she talks about how White Fragility, you display White Fragility by um, di essentially disagreeing with her or being silent or leaving the room or bursting into tears. Pretty much what I understand, pretty much everything apart from agreeing with her you demonstrate white fragility, which a lot of people have described as a Kafka trap, and um, so I'm. That that would be an area. That would be the one point in the book where I was thinking I'm. I'm not sure. Yeah, th th there were sort of a few red flags that came up. Yeah, yeah. that's. I mean, it's really interesting to explore because um, I've read the book and I didn't get those impressions at all. I've listened to her talks and workshops and stuff, and I'm a big fan of what she says. That's the step that I would encourage us to do is like let's let's confirm whether or not our belief about what she's claiming is true. Um, let, you know, let's let's does she claim to speak for white people? Does she claim to um, sort of have all the answers and, and tell people why they're wrong and, and know better than we do what we're doing wrong? I, I think we can. Conf those are those are facts out in the world that we can go. And those facts are about asking her, <laughs> I guess, or reading her book. Um, and I think there is a lot of you know in the same way that like. Someone like James Damore has been, you know, demonized by the left, and you know, Robin has been demonized by that group. You know, the um, I don't know what they're called, but yeah. So I think there's a there's the there's a projection of something, and if that was true, I would not necessarily um, try to defend it. But there's also the possibility that we're misrepresenting her and her work, and I think that's definitely the case. I I encourage people to read the book before. Um, um, thinking that they know what she's saying because it is a nuanced thing that is hard to understand and it's complicated um, and it's easy to mischaracterize which is stuff that we should be having conversations about that kind of stuff and um, putting up gates and saying that they're doing it wrong is, is kind of productive. Yeah and I'd like to, to, to open it out and maybe it would be great to see her in dialogue with someone uh, maybe on the letter platform or uh, on, on this channel or, or wherever um, so maybe let's let's sort of put some feelers out and see whether that might be possible with someone who is critical of her work and knows a bit more about it than than I do. Yeah, that'd be great. I would love that. <laughs> so yeah, my my last question is: there's one very practical tip that I really liked that you talked about in the book, and that's to eat together, um, which I thought was a really like it makes perfect sense. If we're sharing food with someone, it's probably tapping into some very deep rooted patterns of safety and community that um, and that that sounds like if you need to have a difficult conversation maybe do it over dinner is that is that something that that you would advise absolutely it might seem trite but you know I think we there's several reasons why I think this is good number one food you know is a calming sort of satiating chemical that can sort of prevent our blood pressure from spiking suddenly and our heart rate from um, jumping out um, and turning us into um, sort of in the, in moving us to the attack mode. Two, the person has to be in the room with you. You know, oftentimes we, when we think we're arguing with someone or a group of people, that group of people or that person isn't in the room. So this is this requires you to go out and invite them into your house or invite them out with you, um, and they're going to be there so that they can surprise you with a different perspective. Um, and three, I think there's just like some kind of cultural, um, deep-rooted 
cultural elements that you tap into when you're breaking the bread and you're sharing a meal and all the stuff where you start to see them emotionally, subconsciously as friends and family, and you will ask them different kinds of questions. You'll be more likely to, to behave in a productive way than the unproductive way. So, you know, when it comes to solving something really hard like disagreement, um, it's a great it's great to lean on these old technologies that we've invented, you know, thousands of years ago to help us through them. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.